go. All right. The major thing that you're going to need to be able to do when you are presented with a group of um, parameters for a problem is understand how to interpret where to put your aggregate demand in relation to your aggregate supply. So looking at the aggregate supply curve, I'm going to start with the Keynesian model um, because I find it to be the easiest one to use, although the College Board, in terms of the rubrics for the AP exam, has gotten away from this. Some of the books have gotten away from it. It makes the most sense to me, so this is where we're going to start. So we want our, whoa, that sounds strange. We want our axes the same as what we had for aggregate demand, because we're going on the same graph. That's better. So we have price level, and we have GDP. Now, aggregate demand, we said slope down. We're going to ignore that one for just a minute and look at aggregate supply. The Keynesian model has an aggregate supply curve that looks a bit different from anything that we've done with supply so far. And there's a specific reason for this that I'll get to in just a second. All right, now. You have essentially three different regions of this curve, and some books will actually draw it in three different linear sections. This one could be a little bit flatter. Okay? But you've got the straight part, you've got the bendy part, and then you've got the vertical part. Are those okay? the scientific terms? Yes. So let's break this up into regions. Now, <clears throat> the logic behind this is that when your aggregate supply is very low, when you're very low compared to GDP, you know, you have very high unemployment, for example, the curve tends to be flat. Because as we increase the amount of stuff that we're making and people go back to work, we don't see any upward pressure on price. So for this initial range, okay, for our range number one, where it is pretty much horizontal, we can see increases in output, meaning that we are moving to the right along this axis with GDP, but our price is pretty much constant because unemployment is so bad that even increasing spending by a wide margin is not going to cause inflation. Think about it in terms of the massive GDP gap that we have right now. If our unemployment is at 10.2% and climbing and full employment is at 5%, then that tells us our GDP gap is like 10.4%. That is huge. That is huge. So as we are increasing our production, the prices are staying the same. Then as we push closer to full employment, we move into range two. We're still increasing our output. We still see that GDP is increasing as we're moving out this way. But now we're starting to see upward pressure on price. And full employment is somewhere in this range. Okay? So as we keep employing people and spending continues to increase and output continues to increase, now we're putting upward pressure on price. If we push past that, if we go past full employment to the point where, you know, to get anybody to go to work, we have to pay them exorbitant salaries. We have to pay people overtime to keep them coming to work. Now we're seeing upward pressure on price. We're moving up our price axis. But for this vertical range of the curve, the curve here, we see no benefit for GDP. Ideally, we want to stay somewhere in this range. We don't want to have massive unemployment. We don't want to have runaway inflation, which are the two extremes here. Full employment is somewhere in this area. Okay? This is the Keynesian model. Now, 
What you tend to see in books that have been published in, say, the last several years is an aggregate supply curve that's, you know, a little bit more like this. Okay? But you still have to understand the reasoning behind having different sections here. And it really does make sense, especially in just a minute when we throw aggregate demand on here with aggregate supply. Taking the aggregate supply curve the way that we just drew it, looking at it in terms of the Keynesian model. I'm going to throw one of those up here real quick. Okay, a little bit smoother than what we just drew, but it's the same idea. Now, let's say, for example, that you're dealing with a question that says uh, the economy is in a severe recession. Okay, that says we have to be back here somewhere because we're looking at the intersection between aggregate demand and aggregate supply. So here's our price level and here's our GDP. Call this AB1, okay? That's a recession. Um, let's say that we're looking at um, the combination of aggregate demand and aggregate supply if the economy is already at full employment. You probably want to be over here somewhere. Price level two and GDP over here, right? And if we're talking about um, hyperinflation, then we would be somewhere really nasty, like up here. With a really high price level and not much more for GDP. Okay? So look at the differences in the changes on our two axes. Between our first GDP and our second GDP, we get this big jump here with only a small change in price. The reason for that is because we went from a severe recession to full employment. Okay? Big jump in GDP, minimal upward pressure on price. When we went from full employment to hyperinflation, we see very small gains in GDP, and our prices shot way up here, okay? And this is the kind of illustration that you're going to want to be able to do and to explain when you have questions on the AP exam. They're getting away from always using that first big free response question as a you know big 10-part multi-piece thing on ADAS. But you still need to be really good at this for the exam because it's a major part of what we deal with in the course.